The Nuremberg Trials German, Die Nürnberger Prozess were a series of military tribunals held by the Allied forces under international law and the laws of war after World War II. The trials were most notable for the prosecution of prominent members of the political, military, judicial and economic leadership of Nazi Germany, who planned, carried out, or otherwise participated in the Holocaust and other war crimes. The trials were held in the city of Nuremberg, Germany, and their decisions marked a turning point between classical and contemporary international law. The first and best known of these trials was that of the major war criminals before the International Military Tribunal IMT. It was described as the greatest trial in history by Norman Burkett, one of the British judges who presided over them. Held between 20 November 1945 and 1 October 1946, the tribunal was given the task of trying 24 of the most important political and military leaders of the Third Reich, though the proceeding against Martin Bormann was tried in absentia, while another defendant, Robert Ley, committed suicide within a week of the trial's commencement. Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, Wilhelm Bergdorf, Hans Krebs and Joseph Goebbels had all committed suicide in the spring of 1945 to avoid capture, though Himmler was captured before his suicide. Krebs and Bergdorf committed suicide two days after Hitler in the same place. Reinhard Heydrich had been assassinated by Czech partisans in 1942. Joseph Terboven killed himself with dynamite in Norway in 1945. Adolf Eichmann fled to Argentina to avoid Allied capture, but was apprehended by Israel's intelligence service Mossad and hanged in 1962. Hermann Göring was sentenced to death, but committed suicide by consuming cyanide the night before his execution in defiance of his captors. Miklos Horthy appeared as a witness at the ministry's trial held in Nuremberg in 1948. This article primarily deals with the first trial, which was conducted by the IMT. Further trials of lesser war criminals were conducted under Control Council Law No. 10 at the U.S. Nuremberg Military Tribunal NMT, which included the doctor's trial and the judge's trial. The categorization of the crimes and the constitution of the court represented a juridical advance that would be used afterwards by the United Nations for the development of a specific international jurisprudence in matters of war crime, crimes against humanity, war of aggression, as well as for the creation of the International Criminal Court. The Nuremberg Indictment also mentions genocide for the first time in international law count three, war crimes, the extermination of racial and national groups, against the civilian populations of certain occupied territories in order to destroy particular races and classes of people and national, racial, or religious groups, particularly Jews, Poles, and Gypsies and others. Origin. A precedent for trying those accused of war crimes had been set at the end of World War I in the Leipzig War Crimes Trials held in May to July 1921 before the Reichsgericht German Supreme Court in Leipzig, although these had been on a very limited scale and largely regarded as ineffectual. At the beginning of 1940, the Polish government in exile asked the British and French governments to condemn the German invasion of their country. The British initially declined to do so, however, in April 1940, a joint declaration was issued by the British, French and Polish. Relatively bland because of Anglo-French reservations, it proclaimed the trio's desire to make a formal and public protest to the conscience of the world against the action of the German government whom they must hold responsible for these crimes which cannot remain unpunished. Three and a half years later, the stated intention to punish the Germans was much more trenchant. On 1 November 1943, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom and the United States published their Declaration on German Atrocities in Occupied Europe, which gave a full warning that, when the Nazis were defeated, the Allies would pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth in order that justice may be done. The above declaration is without prejudice to the case of the major war criminals whose offences have no particular geographical location and who will be punished by a joint decision of the government of the Allies. This intention by the Allies to dispense justice was reiterated at the Yalta Conference and at Potsdam in 1945. British War Cabinet documents, released on 2 January 2006, showed that as early as December 1944 the Cabinet had discussed their policy for the punishment of the leading Nazis if captured. 
The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, had then advocated a policy of summary execution in some circumstances, with the use of an act of attainder to circumvent legal obstacles, being dissuaded from this only by talks with US and Soviet leaders later in the war. In late 1943, during the tripartite dinner meeting at the Tehran Conference, the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, proposed executing 50,000 to 100,000 German staff officers. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt joked that perhaps 49,000 would do. Churchill, believing them to be serious, denounced the idea of the cold-blooded execution of soldiers who fought for their country, and that he would rather be taken out in the courtyard and shot himself than partake in any such action. However, he also stated that war criminals must pay for their crimes and that, in accordance with the Moscow document which he himself had written, they should be tried at the places where the crimes were committed. Churchill was vigorously opposed to executions, for political purposes. According to the minutes of a meeting between Roosevelt and Stalin at Yalta, on 4 February 1945, at the Lividia Palace, President Roosevelt said that he had been very much struck by the extent of German destruction in Crimea and therefore he was more bloodthirsty in regard to the Germans than he had been a year ago, and he hoped that Marshal Stalin would again propose a toast to the execution of 50,000 officers of the German army." Henry Morgenthau, Jr., U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, suggested a plan for the total denazification of Germany, this was known as the Morgenthau Plan. The plan advocated the forced de-industrialization of Germany and the summary execution of so-called arch-criminals, i.e. the major war criminals. Roosevelt initially supported this plan, and managed to convince Churchill to support it in a less drastic form. Later, details were leaked generating widespread condemnation by the nation's newspapers. Roosevelt, aware of strong public disapproval, abandoned the plan, but did not adopt an alternative position on the matter. The demise of the Morgenthau Plan created the need for an alternative method of dealing with the Nazi leadership. The plan for the trial of European war criminals was drafted by Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson and the War Department. Following Roosevelt's death in April 1945, the new president, Harry S. Truman, gave strong approval for a judicial process. After a series of negotiations between Britain, the U.S., Soviet Union, and France, details of the trial were worked out. The trials were to commence on 20 November 1945, in the Bavarian city of Nuremberg. Topic. Creation of the courts On 20 April 1942, representatives from the nine countries occupied by Germany met in London to draft the Inter-Allied Resolution on German War Crimes. At the meetings in Tehran 1943, Yalta 1945, and Potsdam 1945, the three major wartime powers, the United Kingdom, United States, and the Soviet Union, agreed on the format of punishment for those responsible for war crimes during World War II. France was also awarded a place on the tribunal. The legal basis for the trial was established by the London Charter, which was agreed upon by the four so-called Great Powers on 8 August 1945, and which restricted the trial to punishment of the major war criminals of the European Axis countries." Some 200 German war crimes defendants were tried at Nuremberg, and 1,600 others were tried under the traditional channels of military justice. The legal basis for the jurisdiction of the court was that defined by the instrument of surrender of Germany. Political authority for Germany had been transferred to the Allied Control Council which, having sovereign power over Germany, could choose to punish violations of international law and the laws of war. Because the court was limited to violations of the laws of war, it did not have jurisdiction over crimes that took place before the outbreak of war on 1 September 1939. <laughs> Location Leipzig and Luxembourg were briefly considered as the location for the trial. The Soviet Union had wanted the trials to take place in Berlin, as the capital city of the fascist conspirators, but Nuremberg was chosen as the site for two reasons, with the first one having been the decisive factor. The Palace of Justice was spacious and largely undamaged one of the few buildings that had remained largely intact through extensive Allied bombing of Germany, and a large prison was also part of the complex. Nuremberg was considered the ceremonial birthplace of the Nazi Party. 
It had hosted the party's annual propaganda rallies and the Reichstag session that passed the Nuremberg Laws. Thus it was considered a fitting place to mark the party's symbolic demise. As a compromise with the Soviets, it was agreed that while the location of the trial would be Nuremberg, Berlin would be the official home of the tribunal authorities. It was also agreed that France would become the permanent seat of the IMT and that the first trial several were planned would take place in Nuremberg. Most of the accused had previously been detained at Camp Ashkan, a processing station and interrogation center in Luxembourg, and were moved to Nuremberg for the trial. Topic. Participants Each of the four countries provided one judge and an alternative, as well as a prosecutor. Topic. Judges Major General Iona Nikachenko Soviet main Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Volchkov Soviet alternative Lord Justice Colonel Sir Geoffrey Lawrence British main, President of the Tribunal Sir Norman Burkett British alternative Francis Biddle American main John J Parker American alternative Professor Henri Donadieu de Vabres French main Robert Falco French alternative Topic Chief Prosecutors Attorney General Sir Hartley Shawcross United Kingdom Associate Justice Robert H. Jackson, United States. Lieutenant General Roman Andreevich Rudenko, Soviet Union. François de Menthon, later replaced by Auguste Champetier de Ribes, France. Assisting Jackson were the lawyers Telford Taylor, William S. Kaplan, and Thomas J. Dodd, and Richard Sonnenfeld, a U.S. Army interpreter. Assisting Shawcross were Major Sir David Maxwell Fife and Sir John Wheeler Bennett. Mervyn Griffith Jones, who was later to become famous as the chief prosecutor in the Lady Chatterley's Lover Obscenity trial, was also on Shawcross's team. Shawcross also recruited a young barrister, Anthony Mareko, who was the son of a friend of his, to help the British team with the heavy workload. Topic: <laughs> Defense Counsel. The vast majority of the defense attorneys were German lawyers. These included Georg Froschmann, Heinz Fritz, Hans Fritz, Otto Kranzbuehler, Karl Donitz, Otto Pannenbecker, Wilhelm Frick, Alfred Thoma, Alfred Rosenberg, Kurt Kaufmann, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, Hans Leternzer, General Staff and High Command, Franz Exner, Alfred Jodl, Alfred Seidel, Hans Frank, Otto Stammer, Hermann Göring, Walter Ballas, Gustav Krupp von Bolen und Halbach, Hans Flaxner, Albert Speer, Gunther von Rorscheidt, Rudolf Hess, Egan Kubitschok, Franz von Papen, Robert Robert Servatius, Fritz Sockel, Fritz Sauter, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Walter Funk, Balder von Schirach, Hans Marx, Julius Streicher, Otto Nelt, Wilhelm Keitel, and Herbert Krauss, Rudolf Dix, both working for Hallmar Schacht. The main counsels were supported by a total of 70 assistants, clerks, and lawyers. The defense counsel witnesses included several men who took part in the war crimes during World War II, such as Rudolf Haas. The men testifying for the defense hope to receive more lenient sentences. All of the men testifying on behalf of the defense were found guilty on several counts. Topic. Trial The International Military Tribunal was opened on 19 November 1945 in the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. The first session was presided over by the Soviet judge, Nikachenko. The prosecution entered indictments against 24 major war criminals and seven organizations, the leadership of the Nazi Party, the Reich Cabinet, the Schutzstaffel SS, Sicherheitsdienst SD, the Gestapo, the Sturmabteilung SAW, and the General Staff and High Command, comprising several categories of senior military officers. These organizations were to be declared criminal if found guilty. The indictments were for Participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of a crime against peace Planning, initiating and waging wars of aggression and other crimes against peace War crimes Crimes against humanity 24 accused were, with respect to each charge, either indicted but not convicted I, indicted and found guilty G, or not charged as listed below by defendant, charge, and eventual outcome 
Intelligence tests and psychiatric assessments The Rorschach test was administered to the defendants, along with the thematic apperception test and a German adaptation of the Weschler Bellevue intelligence test. All were above average intelligence, several considerably so. Throughout the trials, specifically between January and July 1946, the defendants and a number of witnesses were interviewed by American psychiatrist Leon Goldenson. His notes detailing the demeanor and comments of the defendants survive, they were edited into book form and published in 2004. Jean Delay was the psychiatric expert for the French delegation in the trial of Rudolf He. Topic. Overview of the trial The 20th of November 1945, start of the trials. The 21st of November 1945, Judge Robert H. Jackson opens for the prosecution with a speech lasting several hours, leaving an impression on both the court and the public. The 26th of November 1945, the Hossbach Memorandum of a conference in which Hitler explained his war plans is presented. The 29th of November 1945, the film Nazi concentration camps is screened. The 30th of November 1945, witness Erwin von Lahausen testifies that Keitel and von Ribbentrop gave orders for the murder of Poles, Jews, and Russian prisoners of war. The 11th of December 1945, the film The Nazi Plan is screened, showing long-term planning and preparations for war by the Nazis. The 3rd of January 1946, witness Otto Ohlendorf, former head of Einsatzgruppe D, admits to the murder of around 90,000 Jews. 3 January 1946, witness Dieter Wieslicini describes the organization of RSHA Department IV B4, in charge of the final solution. 7 January 1946, witness and former SS Obergruppenführer Erich von dem Bach Zilevsky admits to the organized mass murder of Jews and other groups in the Soviet Union. 28 January 1946, witness Marie-Claude Valent Couturier, member of the French Resistance and concentration camp survivor, testifies on the Holocaust, becoming the first Holocaust survivor to do so. 11–12 February 1946, witness and former Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus, who had been secretly brought to Nuremberg, testifies on the question of waging a war of aggression. 14 February 1946, the Soviet prosecutors try to blame the Katyn massacre on the Germans. 19 February 1946, the film Cruelties of the German Fascist Intruders, detailing the atrocities which took place in the extermination camps, is screened. 27 February 1946, witness Abraham Suitkaver testifies on the murder of almost 80,000 Jews in Vilnius by the Germans occupying the city. 8 March 1946, the first witness for the defense testifies, former General Karl Bodenschatz. 13–22 March 1946, Hermann Göring takes the stand. 15 April 1946, witness Rudolf Haas, former commandant of Auschwitz, confirms that Kaltenbrunner had never been there, but admits to having carried out mass murder. 21 May 1946, witness Ernst von Weizsäcker explains the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact of 1939, including its secret protocol detailing the division of Eastern Europe between Germany and the Soviet Union. 20 June 1946, Albert Speer takes the stand. He is the only defendant to take personal responsibility for his actions. 29 June 1946, the defense for Martin Bormann testifies. 1–2 July 1946, the court hears six witnesses testifying on the Katyn massacre, the Soviets fail to pin the blame for the event on Germany. 2 July 1946, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz provides written testimony regarding attacks on merchant vessels without warning, admitting that Germany was not alone in these attacks, as the U.S. did the same. 4 July 1946, final statements for the defense. 26 26th of July 1946 final statements for the prosecution the 30th of July 1946 start of the trial of the criminal organizations the 31st of August 1946 last statements by the defendants the 1st of September 1946 the court adjourns
The 30th of September to the 1st of October 1946, the sentencing occurs, taking two days, with the individual sentences read out on the afternoon of the 1st of October. The accusers were successful in unveiling the background of developments leading to the outbreak of World War II, which cost at least 40 million lives in Europe alone, as well as the extent of the atrocities committed in the name of the Hitler regime. Twelve of the accused were sentenced to death, seven received prison sentences ranging from ten years to life in prison, three were acquitted, and two were not charged. <inaudible> executions The death sentences were carried out on 16 October 1946 by hanging using the standard drop method instead of long drop. The U.S. Army denied claims that the drop length was too short which caused the condemned to die slowly from strangulation instead of quickly from a broken neck, but evidence remains that some of the condemned men died agonizingly slowly, struggling for 14 to 28 minutes before finally choking to death. The executioner was John C. Woods. Woods had hanged 34 U.S. soldiers during the war, botching several of them. The executions took place in the gymnasium of the court building demolished in 1983, although the rumor has long persisted that the bodies were taken to Dachau and burned there, they were actually incinerated in a crematorium in Munich, and the ashes scattered over the river Isar. The French judges suggested that the military condemned Goring, Keitel and Jodel be shot by a firing squad, as a standard for military courts martial, but this was opposed by Biddle and the Soviet judges, who argued that the military officers had violated their military ethos and were not worthy of death by being shot, which was considered to be more dignified. The prisoners sentenced to incarceration were transferred to Spandau prison in 1947. Of the twelve defendants sentenced to death by hanging, two were not hanged. Martin Bormann was convicted in absentia he had, unknown to the Allies, died while trying to escape from Berlin in May 1945, and Hermann Göring committed suicide the night before the execution. The remaining ten defendants sentenced to death were hanged. <laughs> <laughs> Nuremberg Principles The definition of what constitutes a war crime is described by the Nuremberg Principles, a set of guidelines document which was created as a result of the trial. The medical experiments conducted by German doctors and prosecuted in the so-called doctor's trial led to the creation of the Nuremberg Code to control future trials involving human subjects, a set of research ethics principles for human experimentation. Of the indicted organizations the following were found not to be criminal. Reichsregierung the General Staff and High Command," was found not to comprise a group or organization as defined by Article 9 of the London Charter Sturmabteilung Subsidiary and related trials The American authorities conducted subsequent Nuremberg trials in their occupied zone. Other trials conducted after the first Nuremberg trial include the following Auschwitz trial Belsen trial Belzec trial before the first Munich District Court in the mid-1960s, of eight SS men of the Belzec extermination camp Kelmno trials of the Kelmno extermination camp personnel, held in Poland and in Germany. The cases were decided almost 20 years apart. Dachau trials Frankfurt-Auschwitz trials Majdanek trials, the longest Nazi war crimes trial in history, spanning over 30 years mauthausen gusen camp trials Hamburg-Ravensbruck trials Sobibor trial held in Hagen, Germany, in 1965 against the SS men of the Sobibor extermination camp Treblinka trials in Dusseldorf, Germany American role in the trial While Sir Geoffrey Lawrence of Britain was the judge chosen as president of the court, the most prominent of the judges at trial arguably was his American counterpart, Francis Biddle. Prior to the trial, Biddle had been Attorney General of the United States but had been asked to resign by Truman earlier in 1945. Some accounts argue that Truman had appointed Biddle as the main American judge for the trial as an apology for asking for his resignation. Ironically, Biddle was known during his time as Attorney General for opposing the idea of prosecuting Nazi leaders for crimes committed before the beginning of the war, even sending out a memorandum on 5 January 1945 on the subject. 
The note also expressed Biddle's opinion that instead of proceeding with the original plan for prosecuting entire organizations, there should simply be more trials that would prosecute specific offenders. Biddle soon changed his mind, as he approved a modified version of the plan on 21 January 1945, likely due to time constraints, since the trial would be one of the main issues discussed at Yalta. At trial, the Nuremberg Tribunal ruled that any member of an organization convicted of war crimes, such as the SS or Gestapo, who had joined after 1939 would be considered a war criminal. Biddle managed to convince the other judges to make an exemption for any member who was drafted or had no knowledge of the crimes being committed by these organizations. Justice Robert H. Jackson played an important role in not only the trial itself, but also in the creation of the International Military Tribunal, as he led the American delegation to London that, in the summer of 1945, argued in favor of prosecuting the Nazi leadership as a criminal conspiracy. According to Ari Neve, Jackson was also the one behind the prosecution's decision to include membership in any of the six criminal organizations in the indictments at the trial, though the IMT rejected this on the grounds that it was wholly without precedent in either international law or the domestic laws of any of the Allies. Jackson also attempted to have Alfred Krupp be tried in place of his father, Gustav, and even suggested that Alfred volunteer to be tried in his father's place. Both proposals were rejected by the IMT, particularly by Lawrence and Biddle, and some sources indicate that this resulted in Jackson being viewed unfavorably by the latter. Thomas Dodd was a prosecutor for the United States. There was an immense amount of evidence backing the prosecutor's case, especially since meticulous records of the Nazis' actions had been kept. There were records taken in by the prosecutors that had signatures from specific Nazis signing for everything from stationary supplies to Zyklon B gas, which was used to kill the inmates of the death camps. Thomas Dodd showed a series of pictures to the courtroom after reading through the documents of crimes committed by the defendants. The showing consisted of pictures displaying the atrocities performed by the defendants. The pictures had been gathered when the inmates were liberated from the concentration camps. Henry Jarek, a Lutheran pastor, was sent to minister to the Nazi defendants. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Legacy. The tribunal is celebrated for establishing that C rhymes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities, and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced." The creation of the IMT was followed by trials of lesser Nazi officials and the trials of Nazi doctors, who performed experiments on people in prison camps. It served as the model for the International Military Tribunal for the Far East which tried Japanese officials for crimes against peace and against humanity. It also served as the model for the Eichmann trial and for present-day courts at The Hague, for trying crimes committed during the Balkan Wars of the early 1990s, and at Arusha, for trying the people responsible for the genocide in Rwanda. The Nuremberg trials had a great influence on the development of international criminal law. The conclusions of the Nuremberg trials served as models for The Genocide Convention, 1948 The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948 The Nuremberg Principles, 1950 The Convention on the Abolition of the Statute of Limitations on War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity, 1968 the Geneva Convention on the Laws and Customs of War, 1949, its Supplementary Protocols, 1977. The International Law Commission, acting on the request of the United Nations General Assembly, produced in 1950 the report Principles of International Law recognized in the Charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal and in the Judgment of the Tribunal Yearbook of the International Law Commission, 1950, Volume 2. See Nuremberg Principles. The influence of the tribunal can also be seen in the proposals for a permanent international criminal court, and the drafting of international criminal codes, later prepared by the International Law Commission. Tourists can visit courtroom 600 on days when no trial is on. A permanent exhibition has been dedicated to the trials. Topic. Establishment of a permanent international criminal court The Nuremberg Trials initiated a movement for the prompt establishment of a permanent international criminal court, eventually leading over 50 years later to the adoption of the Statute of the International Criminal Court. 
This movement was brought about because during the trials, there were conflicting court methods between the German court system and the U.S. court system. The crime of conspiracy was unheard of in the civil law systems of the continent. Therefore, the German defense found it unfair to charge the defendants with conspiracy to commit crimes, while the judges from common law countries were used to doing so. It IMT was the first successful international criminal court, and has since played a pivotal role in the development of international criminal law and international institutions. Topic. Criticism Critics of the Nuremberg trials argued that the charges against the defendants were only defined as crimes after they were committed and that therefore the trial was invalid, and thus seen as a form of victor's justice. As Bittis observed, the Nuremberg trial continues to haunt us. It is a question also of the weaknesses and strengths of the proceedings themselves. Quincy Wright, writing 18 months after the conclusion of the IMT, explained the opposition to the tribunal thus, the assumptions underlying the Charter of the United Nations, the Statute of the International Court of Justice, and the Charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal are far removed from the positivistic assumptions which greatly influenced the thought of international jurists in the 19th century. Consequently, the activities of those institutions have frequently been vigorously criticized by positivistic jurists who have asked, how can principles enunciated by the Nuremberg Tribunal, to take it as an example, be of legal value until most of the states have agreed to a tribunal with jurisdiction to enforce those principles? How could the Nuremberg Tribunal have obtained jurisdiction to find Germany guilty of aggression, when Germany had not consented to the tribunal? How could the law, first explicitly accepted in the Nuremberg Charter of 1945, have bound the defendants in the trial when they committed the acts for which they were indicted years earlier? Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court Harlan Fisk Stone called the Nuremberg trials a fraud. Chief U.S. Prosecutor Jackson is away conducting his high-grade lynching party in Nuremberg. I don't mind what he does to the Nazis, but I hate to see the pretense that he is running a court and proceeding according to common law. This is a little too sanctimonious a fraud to meet my old-fashioned ideas. Stone wrote, Jackson, in a letter discussing the weaknesses of the trial, in October 1945 told U.S. President Harry S. Truman that the Allies themselves have done or are doing some of the very things we are prosecuting the Germans for. The French are so violating the Geneva Convention in the treatment of prisoners of war that our command is taking back prisoners sent to them. We are prosecuting plunder and our Allies are practicing it. We say aggressive war is a crime and one of our allies asserts sovereignty over the Baltic states based on no title except conquest. Associate Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas charged that the allies were guilty of substituting power for principle at Nuremberg. Quote, I thought at the time and still think that the Nuremberg trials were unprincipled. He wrote, quote, Law was created ex post facto to suit the passion and clamor of the time. U.S. Deputy Chief Counsel Abraham Pomerantz resigned in protest at the low caliber of the judges assigned to try the industrial war criminals, such as those at I.G. Farben. Robert A. Taft, a U.S. Senate Majority Leader from Ohio and son of William Howard Taft, criticized the Nuremberg trials for trying Nazi war criminals under ex post facto laws, which resulted in his failure to secure the Republican nomination for president in 1948. A number of Germans who agreed with the idea of punishment for war crimes admitted trepidation concerning the trials. A contemporary German jurist said that the defendants at Nuremberg were held responsible, condemned and punished, will seem to most of us initially as a kind of historical justice. However, no one who takes the question of guilt seriously, above all no responsibly thoughtful jurist, will be content with this sensibility nor should they be allowed to be. Justice is not served when the guilty parties are punished in any old way, even if this seems appropriate with regard to their measure of guilt. Justice is only served when the guilty are punished in a way that carefully and conscientiously considers their criminal errors according to the provisions of valid law under the jurisdiction of a legally appointed judge. The validity of the court has been questioned on a number of grounds. Topic. Legitimacy. One criticism that was made of the IMT was that some treaties were not binding on the Axis powers because they were not signatories. 
This was addressed in the judgment relating to war crimes and crimes against humanity, which contains an expansion of customary law. The Hague Convention expressly stated that it was an attempt to revise the general laws and customs of war, which it thus recognized to be then existing, but by 1939 these rules laid down in the Convention were recognized by all civilized nations, and were regarded as being declaratory of the laws and customs of war which are referred to in Article 6 B of the London Charter. Introduction of extempore simultaneous interpretation The Nuremberg trials employed four official languages, English, French, German and Russian. In order to address the complex linguistic issues that clouded over the proceedings, interpretation and translation departments had to be established. However, it was feared that consecutive interpretation would slow down the proceedings significantly. What is therefore unique in both the Nuremberg Tribunals and history of the interpretation profession was the introduction of an entirely new technique, extempore simultaneous interpretation. This technique of interpretation requires the interpreter to listen to a speaker in a source or passive language and orally translate that speech into another language in real time, that is, simultaneously, through headsets and microphones. Interpreters were split into four sections, one for each official language, with three interpreters per section working from the other three languages into the fourth their mother tongue. For instance, the English booth consisted of three interpreters, one working from German into English, one working from French, and one from Russian, etc. Defendants who did not speak any of the four official languages were provided with consecutive court interpreters. Some of the languages heard over the course of the proceedings included Yiddish, Hungarian, Czech, Ukrainian, and Polish. The equipment used to establish this system was provided by IBM, and included an elaborate setup of cables which were hooked up to headsets and single earphones directly from the four interpreting booths often referred to as the aquarium. Four channels existed for each working language, as well as a root channel for the proceedings without interpretation. Switching of channels was controlled by a setup at each table in which the listener merely had to turn a dial in order to switch between languages. People tripping over the floor laid cables often led to the headsets getting disconnected, with several hours at a time sometimes being taken in order to repair the problem and continue on with the trials. Interpreters were recruited and examined by the respective countries in which the official languages were spoken, the United States, United Kingdom, France, the Soviet Union, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, as well as in special cases Belgium and the Netherlands. Many were former translators, army personnel, and linguists, some were experienced consecutive interpreters, others were ordinary individuals and even recent secondary school graduates who led international lives in multilingual environments. It was, and still is believed, that the qualities that made the best interpreters were not just a perfect understanding of two or more languages, but more importantly a broad sense of culture, encyclopedic knowledge, inquisitiveness, as well as a naturally calm disposition. With the simultaneous technique being extremely new, interpreters practically trained themselves, but many could not handle the pressure or the psychological strain. Many often had to be replaced, many returned to the translation department, and many left. Serious doubts were given as to whether interpretation provided a fair trial for the defendants, particularly because of fears of mistranslation and errors made on transcripts. The translation department had to also deal with the overwhelming problem of being understaffed and overburdened with an influx of documents that could not be kept up with. More often than not, interpreters were stuck in a session without having proper documents in front of them and were relied upon to do site translation or double translation of texts, causing further problems and extensive criticism. Other problems that arose included complaints from lawyers and other legal professionals with regard to questioning and cross-examination. Legal professionals were most often appalled at the slower speed at which they had to conduct their task because of the extended time required for interpreters to render an interpretation properly. Also, a number of interpreters protested the idea of using vulgar language, especially if it referred to Jews or the conditions of the Nazi concentration camps. Bilingual, trilingual members who attended the trials picked up quickly on this aspect of character and were equally quick to file complaints. Yet, despite the extensive trial and error, without the interpretation system the trials would not have been possible and in turn revolutionized the way multilingual issues were addressed in tribunals and conferences. 
A number of the interpreters following the trials were immediately recruited into the newly formed United Nations, while others returned to their ordinary lives, pursued other careers, or worked freelance. Outside the boundaries of the trials, many interpreters continued their positions on weekends interpreting for dinners, private meetings between judges, and excursions between delegates. Others worked as investigators or editors, or aided the translation department when they could, often using it as an opportunity to sharpen their skills and to correct poor interpretations on transcripts before they were available for public record. For further reference, a book titled The Origins of Simultaneous Interpretation, The Nuremberg Trial, written by interpreter Francesca Geba, was published by the University of Ottawa Press in 1998. Today, all major international organizations, as well as any conference or government that uses more than one official language, uses extempore simultaneous interpretation. Notable bodies include the Parliament of Kosovo with three official languages, the Parliament of Canada with two official languages, the Parliament of South Africa with eleven official languages, the European Union with twenty-four official languages, and the United Nations with six official working languages. Topic see also Nuremberg Trials Portal Nuremberg Trials Bibliography Command Responsibility Dora Trial Eichmann in Jerusalem Einsatzgruppen Trial International Military Tribunal for the Far East Judgment at Nuremberg 1961 Film Nuremberg 2000 Film List of Axis Personnel Indicted for War Crimes Nuremberg Diary, an account of observations and discussions with the defendants by an American psychiatrist Research Materials, Max Planck Society Archive Superior Orders Tokyo War Crime Times Tribunal Transitional Justice Topic References Topic Notes Topic Citations Topic Avalon Project These citations refer to documents at the International Military Tribunal for Germany. The Avalon Project, Documents in Law, History, and Diplomacy. Yale Law School Lillian Goldman Law Library. Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading Conant, Robert E. Justice at Nuremberg. New York, Harper and Rowe. ISBN 0060151117 X. Premal, Kim C., Stiller, Alexa, eds. 2012. Reassessing the Nuremberg Military Tribunals, Transitional Justice, Trial Narratives, and Historiography. Bergen Books. ISBN 978-0-85745-532-1. Herbert R. Regenbogen, Christoph J. M. Safferling, The Nuremberg Trials, International Criminal Law Since 1945. De Gruyter 2006, ISBN 978-3-11-094484-6. External links International Center for Transitional Justice, Criminal Justice page documentary shown at the Nuremberg Trial in November 1945 exhibiting the horrors of the concentration camps The Nuremberg Trials on the Yad Vashem website Official records of the Nuremberg Trials the Blue Series in 42 volumes from the records of the Library of Congress Donovan Nuremberg Trials Collection Cornell Law Library Nuremberg Trials Project, a digital document collection Harvard Law School Library The Avalon Project Charter of the International Military Tribunal Nuremberg Trials. The subsequent Nuremberg Trials Special focus on the trials, USHMM A Tree Fell in the Forest, the Nuremberg Judgment's 60 Years on, Jurist Bringing a Nazi to Justice, How I Cross-Examined Fat Boy Goring, Guardian.co.uk The Nuremberg Judgments, Chapter 6 from the High Cost of Vengeance, by Frida Utley, Henry Regnery Company, Chicago, 1948. Made available by The Frida Utley Foundation. Francine Hirsch, The Soviets at Nuremberg, International Law, Propaganda, and the Making of the Post-War Order, International Military Tribunal, Nuremberg Trials Transcripts and Documentary Evidence of German Medical Experiments in the Commission of War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity 1946-1947, United States National Library of Medicine. Nuremberg Trial Collection. The Northwestern University Special Collections Archival Collection amassed by Charles J. Gallagher, a court reporter at the trials. Works by Nuremberg Trials at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks